We've asked our speakers, for the most part, to deliver two lectures this time and also prepare two manuscripts, as I say, for the most part. And we're very grateful they were willing to do that. I don't know that anybody said that this year, but that just puts a lot more on them. We did ask them to keep it, that is, the length of their manuscripts, uh, more brief than they were in times past, but it's still a lot of work. And we appreciate their work on that. Brother Danny Douglas is certainly somebody that we deeply appreciate. Those of us who know him and count him as a friend know of his dedication to the Lord. And we're grateful he can be a part of this lectureship. He's a native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. He's been preaching the gospel since 1977. And he served Churches of Christ as the evangelist in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia. He's done full-time work in the Ukraine and in the United Kingdom. When you get a chance sometime, uh, talk to him about it, and it's interesting. Uh, anytime you go overseas and do anything, but especially live over there for quite a while, it gets rather interesting, the things that happen. He worked in public education for about 10 years, where he served as teacher, principal, and college instructor, and is now involved in business. He preached over the radio for over 20 years as a teacher in Truth Bible Institute. He's been preaching for various churches, and what's the name of the congregation now? I can't remember. Central, Central Congregation, Mount Pleasant. Mount Pleasant. And uh, they just started. They're trying to get off the ground. Uh, if you've got any help, you can give him not only concerning the church there, and I speak financially, but also he's so involved in the work in the Philippines and doing a great work with those brethren who have suffered a lot for the cause of the Lord in the last few years, and especially for false brethren. And you might keep them in mind and also him in mind. Uh, we're thankful for his presence, and now we want to hear him speak. Brother Danny, please come. Four to five minutes. Four to Thank you. Thank you, Brother Brown. It's again a privilege to be up here before you. And I have to get my big notes out here a little bit. I'm not going to read a lot to you, but I, I am thankful to say that when it comes to reading from these community church people that I have to read them, and I'm glad I can quote the Bible more than I can them. Of course, some brethren, they know how to quote false teachers and liberals more than they do the Bible. And though we all have more to learn about the scripture, I'd much rather be able to quote the Bible than to quote these false teachers and falsifiers in the brotherhood or who were once of the brotherhood. Now, uh, <clears throat> Brother Ken Chumley asked me at lunchtime an interesting question. He said, are you gonna be the speaker for the community church? That shows you the difference a preposition can make so no, I'm going to speak on the community church and uh, why it is a counterfeit church. The question here is what is the community church? But I'm going to deal basically with why it is a counterfeit church. Now, you know, when people uh, use counterfeit money, they pass it off as the real thing, but it's not, as we know. And uh, the community church may pass themselves off as Christians and the New Testament church, but they are not. They, in fact, if you really study the Bible, it doesn't really take a deep knowledge of the Bible to see that they are truly a counterfeit and not the church of the Lord. But I do want to say again before I get started, I'm thankful too and for the Lord's church here at Spring and Brother Brown and, the, and his faithfulness and the godly elders and the gracious hospitality extended this week by Brother and Sister Brown and the church here and the ladies and uh, the fine and sumptuous food that they are treating us with. We're so thankful for that. I feel like I'll be a bigger preacher after this lectureship. <laughs> well, now, as we begin today, the first place the community church movement implies that Jesus Christ is a false teacher. Have you thought about that? You know, they 
these and the uh, those going off in apostasy today will will make a lot about the fact that we don't really have to follow a pattern in all this. But you know they really do follow a pattern. They follow the pattern of Willow Creek and Bill Hybels in the Chicago area, the modern church growth movement. They follow the pattern of uh, Rick uh, Warren and um, Saddleback out in Orange County, California, Willow Creek in Chicago, as we said. But they also follow the community church philosophy that's been around for a long time. Frank Mead in his handbook of the denomination says that this movement started in the mid-1800s. And in fact, there's a book by David Piper that was published in 1922. And it's amazing how these community churches, whether they have sprung up from the denominations or wayward and erring brethren, they follow this philosophy that Piper sets forth. Piper says, regarding the community church movement, <clears throat> it does not seek harmony through theological or doctrinal agreement, a thing patently impossible, but in the common purpose of all Christians to live lives of spiritual power, expressing in word and act, individually and socially, the teachings and spirit of their common Lord. Obviously, this is a contradiction because to follow the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ obviously means that we will in fact be in doctrinal agreement. Moreover, it implies that our Lord is a false teacher in that he prayed for oneness in the very shadow of the cross. And I'd like this time to look at John 17 verse 20 to 23. And as we read this portion of the Lord's Prayer in John 17, let us ask the question, would the Father and the Son ever be in doctrinal disagreement or division or disharmony? Can you envision that God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, would ever be divided in teaching and doctrine and purpose? But yet Jesus prays that our oneness and, and our unity would be likened to that existing between the Father and the Son. And so in John 17, verse 20 to 23, Jesus prayed, Neither pray I for these alone, that is the twelve, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that is the apostles' doctrine given by inspiration of the Spirit, the all truth, John 16, 13, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou sent me. Now that right there tells us that all these religious divisions, including the community church, does not engender belief in the Son of God in the world because they promote division and disunity and not unity. And he says, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. One thing that becomes apparent about the community church is that it puts community over doctrine. It is very undermining and demeaning toward doctrine. And this is again a contradiction of the Lord Jesus and his apostles. John said that we cannot even have the Father and the Son if we do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, which is the totality of the New Testament. In 2 John verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. But the second reason the community church is counterfeit and false is because the gospel is universal in nature. According to Mead, and I believe that he is correct in what 
the community church purports to do here. Each church is adjusted to the needs of a different community or what they might perceive to be their needs. To refocus primary loyalty from organizations outside a community to the community itself and by addressing specific needs there. Well, is our loyalty to be to the community or to Christ? And then also, he says, to affect a more relevant religion. Well, now, the gospel is always relevant in every age. And the gospel of Christ addresses the greatest and most important needs of all, and that is the needs of every community and every person on the earth the needs of the soul, and to provide the soul's salvation, deliverance from sin and coming to God and to Jesus Christ. As Paul said in Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now Rick Warren of the Saddleback Community Church in Orange County, California, and the author of The Purpose Driven Church says, quote, for your church to be most effective in evangelism, you must decide on a target. Discover what types of people live in your area. Decide which of those groups your church is best equipped to reach and then discover which styles of evangelism best match your target. While your church may never be able to reach everyone, it is especially suited to reaching certain types of people. Knowing who you're trying to reach makes evangelism much easier. Evidently, Jesus Christ considered the gospel message to be relevant to every community and moreover for every soul. Because the Lord said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now this is the amazing thing about the gospel. Regardless of our educational background or EKOC, socioeconomic economic level or nationality or race or color or culture, we can all understand the gospel and we can understand it alike. It feeds every soul. It's for every person. And Paul said in Galatians 3.21, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, Brother Brown mentioned that I have done mission work, and indeed I have, in the Ukraine, in Russia, in the Philippines, and in the United Kingdom. And all of these cultures uh, differ vastly in various ways. But there's one thing that I've always seen, that no matter where you go, whether to the tropical regions or the poverty-stricken areas or the more affluent areas, or Europe, or United States, Southeast Asia, or wherever you go, that people without a central headquarters or human authority on this earth who are following the gospel, the New Testament, are all preaching and teaching and practicing the same thing. And they don't have to have a hotline to the United States to do that. All they have to have is the New Testament. Because God gave the New Testament where we could all understand it. The Holy Spirit gave the gospel for everyone. And they preached the gospel with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. 1 Peter 1 and verse number 12. Now when I was over uh, in Chesapeake, Virginia several years ago preaching. And you know that's uh, over near Virginia Beach and People would come through Chesapeake going down to the Outer Banks of North Carolina to the beach and, and all this. And sometimes we'd have people coming in there wearing shorts. And, and, and I knew that some of the people in the congregation 
also were involved in immodest apparel. I knew that. I saw the way some of them dressed. So I preached on modesty and immodest apparel. So a brother in the congregation came up to me and said, well, that's, that's because you're from down in Tennessee. This is a beach area. Well, I got news for you. There's immodesty of plenty in Tennessee in every state of the union for that matter. But regardless of that, he was trying to say, well, you know, that's what you preach down in Tennessee where you don't have the beach and all this. So it wasn't long after that that I preached a sermon, and that is the universality of the gospel. The gospel is universal. If we live in Las Vegas, we still preach against gambling, right? I heard a story of a, a preacher up in Kentucky one time, and, and uh, he preached uh, against alcohol. And uh, one of the men of the congregation came up to him. He said, uh, well, don't you know that the liquor industry is a very uh, prominent industry here in Kentucky? And so he went on, and he, later on he preached on tobacco. And the uh, same brother came up to him and said, well, don't you know that we raise tobacco here in Kentucky? And then later on he preached on gambling. The same brother came up, well, don't you know we have horse racing in Kentucky? You know, the Kentucky Derby and all that. And uh, he said, what would you suggest that I preach on? He said, why don't you preach on witch doctors? We don't have one of them within a 1,000 miles from here. <laughs> well, friends, it doesn't make any difference where we live. Sin is sin is sin, and the truth is the truth is the truth, and we are to preach the same gospel regardless of where we live. And Paul said that we're all to walk by the same rule, Philippians 3.16. That is the doctrine of Christ and none other. And by the way, since I did mention in modest apparel, Paul over there in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9 and 10, and of course, this is about the women dressing immodestly, but men also are to be modest. Paul said to keep thyself pure to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.22. A person that is not dressed outwardly in a godly and righteous manner is not going to be pure inwardly either. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Matthew 5, 8. And we need to remember that, that the way we dress says a lot about us. Mary Quant, the mother of the miniskirt, said that a woman's dress is the mirror of her mind. You know, no doubt, she's a very worldly woman. But she spoke the truth there. Now Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame, faithfulness, and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. But now, <clears throat> the gospel does not change from place to place. In Romans 2, 16, Paul speaks of the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. My friends, we're all going to be judged according to the gospel of Christ. And the Lord said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, verse 48. But number three this afternoon, the community church is a work of darkness, moreover, because its very existence implies that doctrine is unimportant. Now, uh, Willow Creek, which, of course, is it and the saddleback are the two famous models that community church people follow, whether they have a denominational background or if they have a background of the Lord's church, this is what they say in their statement. We try not to be dogmatic about matters on which Bible-based believers have held divergent views. We want our core beliefs to be centered and his message is found in and supported by the clearest passages of Scripture. More obscure doctrine or teachings with less support are left to individuals to sort out on their own. We take no official position in these areas. Now, there are several problems with this statement. 
But no doubt it is typical of the community church overall, even among those who have had a background among the Lord's people. Look at one or two of these problems, for example. It said regarding those who have held divergent views. Well, no doubt one of the most controversial uh, subjects in religion is the plan of salvation and baptism. Does that mean we're not going to take any stand on baptism or we shouldn't take a stand on baptism because there's such widespread disagreement and divergence of views? Evidently, the Apostle Paul didn't know anything about that kind of attitude, or rather, he didn't have it, because inspired of the Spirit, he said, there is one baptism there in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. There's only one, not more than one. And just look at the many things that there are divergent views that people have. Divorce, remarriage, the doctrine of the one church, how we are to worship, and so many other things pertaining to salvation. And by the way, there's another thing here that we want to mention regarding the community church is that they seek to make matters of faith and heaven and hell issues matters of opinion. For example, an instrument of music. They try to say, well, that's just a matter of opinion. That's not a matter of doctrine or the faith. This idea that there are some passages of Scripture that are more important to emphasize or some doctrines that are more important to emphasize in the Bible than others. Now, who's going to be the judge of that? Is the community church going to be the judge? Are Bill Hybels and Rick Warren and other well-known religious leaders, are they going to be the judge on what's the most important? Well, we know what the real judge said, don't we? He said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Matthew 28, verse 20. Not just the things that we agree on or the things that seem more important to some people, but all things. Paul said that I have not shown and declaring to you the whole counsel of God or all the counsel of God. Acts 20, verse 27. My friends, we have no right to leave out any of it or to de-emphasize any part of God's word lest one day we be found accountable for violating that very severe warning near the very end of the Bible in Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. Where John said, For I testify unto every man to hear the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. <clears throat> You know, I got up here today realizing this was after lunch. Uh, I went to see a youth director one time in a large congregation where a couple of my, uh, well, my nephew and niece were members and a youth minister. And he had taken the young people off to hear Jeff Walling, so I went to see him. And you know what he told me? He said, well, I'd rather take and go hear somebody like that that's an interesting speaker than hear some dull preacher or something like that. Well, you know, truth is not dull, is it, friends? If we love the truth, it won't be dull to us. Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled, or they shall be filled. But you know, the community church, the point I'm making, they emphasize entertainment. They're entertainment oriented. As uh, Brother Jay Choate said that he likened these big ones like, I think, Willow Creek or Saddleback to a Broadway show. A lot of these other community churches that are smaller are aping and they're imitating them. They're trying to put on a show, keep everybody entertained. It's almost like the cardinal sin, so to speak, with them is boredom. 
You just don't be boring. Don't bore people with a lot of Bible preaching. Haven't we had some great preaching this week here in this lectureship? And wonderful lessons. There's another thing here that is implied by this that's very disturbing. And that is that we may not be able to understand everything alike. Is that what Paul said in Ephesians 5, 17? He said, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, as we think further on this matter, there's a community church near where we live. It's called the Murray Hills Church, and they used to have on their website Murray Hills, A Church of Christ, in small letters. And they may still do that, but... They call themselves the Murray Hills Church. And they say this, we must accept the fact that we cannot be right about everything. Well, evidently they've discovered something that the Lord didn't teach. That we don't have to try to be right about everything. Again, what did Jesus say? Teaching them to observe most of the things or a part of the things that I've said in you teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. All things. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. If we want the Lord to be with us, we better strive with all of our being to observe all things that are in the New Testament. Even those things that the Spirit revealed through the apostles after the Lord went back to heaven Jesus said, he shall take a mine there in John 16. So the things that are taught in the New Testament after the book of John are just as much the word of Christ as those things that are in the red letter New Testament of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But he says here, we must accept the fact that we cannot be right about everything and are therefore completely dependent on God's graciousness and mercy. Well, no doubt we would not have a doubt or question about that. Of course we are dependent upon God's grace and mercy, without which we cannot enter heaven. And we know we're saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, by his mercy, and there in Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. But yet, our obedience to Christ is also involved in our salvation in order to be the happy recipients of God's saving grace. We know that in Hebrews 5 and 9, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 and verse 15. And ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever, there's the all things, whatsoever I command you. John 15, verse 14. Do we not also understand, and we must, that God's grace and mercy and love is involved in giving us the scriptures and giving us teaching that we can know and understand and can follow? Notice Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the first part of verse 12. That the... God's grace appeared according to Paul here and that it appeared in the form of teaching. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, teaching us. God's grace appeared in the form of teaching made possible by the blood of Christ. Do we know that the New Testament was brought about by the blood of Christ? As one of the old preachers used to say, I believe it was Brother Gus Nichols, that the blood of Christ is on every word of the New Testament. That's a great statement right there. Jesus said in the instituting of the Lord's Supper, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The New Testament in my blood. Hebrews 10, 19 speaks of the blood of the everlasting covenant. The blood of the everlasting covenant. What time did I get up here, Brother Brown? I... Okay, well, I'll, I'll stop sometime for another thing. All right. <laughs> but anyway. 
Okay. All right, that's good enough then. All right, the community church, moreover, is counterfeit because it teaches that we can follow Christ and have his spirit without following the words and pattern of the New Testament. I'd like to go back and read uh, Piper's statement again in his book. It does not seek harmony through theological or doctrinal agreement, a thing patently impossible, and that's a lie because the Lord said we could. But in the common purpose of all Christians to live lives of spiritual power, he says we can do this in word and act without doctrinal agreement. Individually and socially, the teachings and spirit of their common Lord. Another quote that I would like to read is uh, from a statement in one of Brother Guy and Wood's question and answer books, the first volume, uh, question and answer, page 194. He quotes a Dr. A.W. Fortune, sometime professor in the College of the Bible and pastor of the Central Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky. In his book, The Disciples in Kentucky, this is what Fortune says. The controversies through which the disciples, and that's not talking about true disciples, but the disciples' denomination, the disciples, denom the disciples have passed from the beginning to the present time have been the result of two different interpretations of their mission. There have been those who believed it is the spirit of the New Testament church that should be restored, and in our method of worship, the church must adapt itself to changing conditions. Now that describes the Christian church overall right there. That describes to a degree also the really the philosophy of the community church movement. An effort to restore the spirit of the New Testament church. And then he says there have been those who regarded the New Testament church as a fixed pattern for all time, now that's us right there. A fixed pattern for all time and our business is to hold rigidly to that pattern regardless of consequences. Because of these attitudes, conflicts were inevitable. Now we've never been a part of the disciples denomination. But this I believe does represent two completely different views of our purpose. The one to hold fast the New Testament pattern according to the words given by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2.13. And the other is this idea that we can somehow restore the spirit of the New Testament church without following rigidly the pattern. But friends, how can we do one without the other? How can we do that? Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6 and verse 63. In Titus chapter 1, verse 13, Paul said that we are to hold fast, that is firmly, how to hold fast the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And then the inspired writer in Hebrews 8, referring back to Exodus 25, 40, regarding what God said to Moses, See that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. We also learn in that Hebrews, the 8th chapter in verse 2, of a more important tabernacle than that which God gave Moses a pattern by which to make. And that is the one mentioned in Hebrews 8 in verse 2. A minister, we're speaking, speaking of the Lord, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now what is that? That's the very thing that Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now if God saw the great importance and impressed it upon Moses to follow the very pattern that he gave for that earthly tabernacle for the children of Israel, why would he leave us without an inspired pattern for that which is much more important? The blood-bought church of God, Acts 20, verse 28. 
Now, moreover, the community church implies that truth is not absolute by their practice and by their teaching. I found this on the Community Church of Hendersonville, that is outside of Nashville, Tennessee, website. I want to read a few things from their website, giving some of their history. During this time, CCC continued to struggle with its identity as attendance declined. And this is going over their 20 year history. But they began, continued to struggle with their identity. And then on down in 1999, the church re examined its practice, doctrines, theology, and traditions. And then it says in 2000, the church became Community Church of Hendersonville, CCH. Worship style slash practice and doctrinal positions were modified. Now this is an example of this ever changingness, adapting to the conditions of society. In other words, the attitudes and views of men or what men want, what people want. This ever changing re-examination and changing searching for identity and core beliefs. This proves that the community church is not the Lord's church because of its ever, ever changing nature. But the Lord's truth is indeed absolute. Paul said that God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 does that not imply an absolute standard of truth that we must come to. The truth doesn't conform to us. We must come to the truth. And Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In 1 Peter 1.25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. But then here's another reason that the community church is a counterfeit church. And that is that they are ashamed of the Lord's church. And I'm speaking particularly of those of the background among churches of Christ. Also on the Hendersonville Community Church website, it says regarding a certain point in time, somewhere around 2000, the shepherds believed that God was leading CCC in an emerging direction that would formally dissolve its identity as a church of Christ and established it as an independent transdenominational fellowship. Do we not know that to be ashamed of the Lord's church is in fact to be ashamed of Him, Jesus Himself? And the Lord warned that whosoever should be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. In Luke 9, verse 26. In Acts 9, in verse 4, when the Lord appeared, to Saul on the road to Damascus. What did he say to this Saul who was making havoc of the church? Acts 8, 3. Did he say, Why persecutest thou my church? He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Because to persecute and to hurt the church of our Lord is to hurt his bride. And to hurt the bride of Christ is to oppose the very Son of God himself. You know, friends, I, there are those in the brotherhood today, and even some that we've been very surprised and disappointed in, who disdain the efforts that we make in such lectureships as these. But I want to say this today before I sit down, and that is to work to preserve the purity of the bride of Christ is one of the greatest works we could ever do. Amen. And we know that because of what Paul said. And we should never let any of these so-called sound brethren who don't have the backbone to do this to make us feel guilty about what we're doing Amen. and condemning error and working to keep the bride pure. In Ephesians 5, 26, 27, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but, that, sh but that, that it should be holy and without blemish. And Paul told the Ephesian elders that he worked to do this. 
in effect, when he said, warning everyone night and day with tears there in the context of Acts 20 and 29, 30, and 31. But now I would like to mention this one other example of a community church, and that is the Ethos Church. And this is a near one found in Nashville, Tennessee. It says on their website, Ethos is a church of Christ. <clears throat> the church of Christ began as, what do you think they're going to say here? As a part of the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement, a movement determined to be simply Christian. My friends, the true church of Christ did not begin in the Stone Campbell Movement. Amen. It began in Acts chapter 2 on the first Pentecost, after the resurrection of our Lord with the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. And we can read the chapter of Acts 2 to see that. But then it goes on down to say, since Ethos Church has only been in existence for a little over two years, and that's two years too much, we do not currently have our own biblically qualified elders. By God's grace, please don't blame this on God, but it says, by God's grace, he has provided us with 14 wonderful elders from the Harpeth Hills Church of Christ, our partner church, that have agreed to serve as the temporary eldership of Ethos Church until God raises up elders from within our church body. Now you see, here's something else. They're here teaching that we've got one eldership in one locality over what's supposed to be a church in another locality. Well, what did Peter say about that? In 1 Peter 5, verse 1, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, not somewhere else. Now that should forevermore close the matter as to what they're doing as being very unscriptural. Now I could, if I had the time left, go ahead and talk about the pragmatic nature of the community church movement. And I believe that's one of the key words. The end justifies the means. Do whatever it takes, as another brother said this week, you know, to get the warm bodies in the building. A market-driven religion, entertainment-oriented, not God-centered, not Christ-centered, not to worship God in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. Don't be offensive, but tickle the ears of men. And I could also go on to say, in 1 Kings 12, we find a pragmatist by the name of Jeroboam. He told those that he had led astray from their rightful capital and center of worship in Jerusalem. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods of Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he made these two calves of gold, one in Dan and one in Bethel. He was a pragmatist. Whatever it takes to keep them following me and not to go back under King Rehoboam, that's what I'm going to do. The end justifies the means. Well, the Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And I want to close with what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 to 4. And this uh, contradicts the community church philosophy to don't preach anything offensive, don't be preachy. Paul said, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead is appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, and friends it has, in our brotherhood, when they will not endure a sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves, teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. So let us preach the word and let us hear, obey, and love the word. Thank you. Amen. Well, we're indebted to you, Brother Danny, for that great lesson. It's one we don't like to hear, but it should be heard. Some of the people that used to claim they wanted to hear it to be warned are now traveling down the very path 
that he showed us today that is foreign to the teaching of the New Testament. Well, if it's just a few people in a building somewhere they don't even own or in somebody's house that's serving God as he wants to be served, as the Bible authorizes, then we're doing right. And that's the way it ought to be. I'm, I'm afraid of, I've been afraid of brethren for a long time, but I'm afraid of, of, of brethren when it comes to willingness to be right if you're the only one. It seems like that we can't obey God, at least some brethren can't, unless they can all do it in a groupie session. Have you ever noticed in reading throughout the Old Testament that the men are held up as great, zealous, faithful people who love God with their whole heart? And every time it picks out them having to stand alone. Have you ever noticed that? Is that by accident? Is that not saying something concerning what one must do to be saved by Christ? Well, we thank you very much, and let's all draw strength from this to press on to be steadfast in our faithful service to him. We'll stand adjourned till about 2.30, about 10 minutes, then we'll come to the next session.